Hello? Hello? Hello?
Good morning. Let us gather ourselves by standing to sing hymn number 802, For the Fruits of All Creation. Please have a seat. And I would invite you to turn to the announcements on the back of the bulletin. A reminder that everyone is welcome to our prayer Bible study, which is happening on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. And even if you missed the first meeting last week, you are still more than welcome to join us this coming Wednesday. Following the service on October 21st, in a couple weeks, we will have our annual flu shot available. And uh, anyone who would like to receive the flu shot can receive it for free. Uh, and they have to fill out this uh, form, which will be available that day, but there are some available in the hallway on the table in the hallway. But you also need to bring your health card. So just some reminders there. On Sunday, October 28th, I'm excited to hear the Reverend Dr. Robert Paul, who is Dean of St. Andrew's Hall and Professor of Mission Theology at Vancouver School of Theology. The St. Andrew's Hall is the Presbyterian uh, Seminary at UBC, and so uh, someone who is a, a great academic, but also teaching our young ministers, up-and-coming ministers, and he will be here to be our guest preacher. Following the service, uh, we will have a pizza lunch, and you are invited to stick around, and he will lead a, a short forum on modern mission in the church. So I'd encourage you to uh, mark your calendars for that. And a reminder that if you want an audio stream of the service uh, or you want to listen to the service at a different time, uh, you uh, can go to our church website and click on live audio stream. You'll note there that there is a, a new position that the uh, Presbytery of Vancouver Island is looking to fill. It is a pastor to pastor's position for the North Island Church. And in this case, North Island is Duncan to Campbell River. And uh, it just so happens that I am the, the chair of that search committee. So if you know of anyone or if you seem interested, please let me know. Or if you want some more information, um, please contact me. A reminder that we have our Some Like It Hot Chili Night on October 19th. I want to remind you, last week I said it's not going to be hot chili, spicy hot chili. It's going to be temperature hot, but uh, not spicy hot. You can actually make it as hot as you would like because there will be hot sauce on the side for you to add to it. Um, and I would encourage you to come out uh, for the dinner, uh, for the entertainment. The entertainment is Sweet Santa Fe, uh, a local group but that have, have just released a CD and have just completed a a, a Western Canada tour 
Um, so it's kind of an honor to have them here and come and play for us, uh, as well as amazing crafts by our uh, many crafters here in the congregation. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is, if you're not out of town, this is where you should be on October 19th. It is, uh, it is gonna be a, a great night. Are there any other announcements that I may have forgotten? Then let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We begin our worship by, by singing hymn number 407, or the other one it is, isn't it? <laughs> we will uh, begin our service <coughs> of uh, uh, singing song number 802, For the Fruits of All Creation. <laughs>
please remain standing if you are able and join me in the responsive call to worship printed in the bulletin and found on the screen. It is good to give thanks to God. We sing for joy for all that has been given to us. Let us worship God together. Please be seated. Thank you very much, choir. Let us come to God with our prayers of approach and confession, which are printed in the bulletin and found on the screen. Let us pray them together. Eternal God, we gather in praise and worship as your people, believing that when two or more gather in your name, you are there in the midst of them. Draw us near to you. Enrich our faith and our worship through the provision of your Holy Spirit. We desire to stand before you with deep gratitude for all that is around us. Yet, merciful God, we often come to you with more complaints than thanksgiving. Transform the way we see the world so that our attitudes are full of gratitude. We follow too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. As we come into this time of communion, open us up to your service so that we in turn can show grace to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Only Christ is in a position to condemn. 
And Christ is the one who died for us, rose for us, prays for us, and forgives us. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, may we give thanks and forgive one another. Amen. Let us sing together hymn number 441, Can a Little Child Like Me. Uh, Tristan and Liam, do you want to come up? Hi. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Hi, Tristan. Have you had a good week with uh, Grandma and Grandpa? <laughs> yes, yes. Grandma and Grandpa, have you had a good time with Tristan? Yeah, of course, of course. Well, you guys, I've got something in here. Uh, that I, I, I'm wondering if you could tell me what it is. Now, I had actually trouble getting this, this off the thing. So I'm going to ask Wayne to grab the bottom and I'm going to pull. <laughs> See, I told you. <laughs> All right. <sighs> All right. Can anyone tell me what this is? Yeah, it's a, it's a mat. It's a mat, like a, like a doormat, we would call it. Now, now, um, Liam, do you know what that word is that's on it? Yeah, not yet. No, that, that's cool. Tristan, do you know what the word is? What that says there? What's, what's this though? What, what's this word? Butter. That's cool. Yeah, no, that's all right. What does it say on it? Welcome. Welcome. Yes. Now, you see, usually you would put something like this at your front door. And it tells people two important things. One, please wipe your feet before you come into my house. And two, you're welcome, right? Now, what are some other ways that we might be able to make people feel welcome when they come into our house? Do you think I could maybe ask the other people in the congregation? What are some ways that we can make people feel welcome? Invite them in, shake their hands, smile at them, give them a hug. See, there's all kinds of ways, right? Yeah? Make them a cup of tea. Yes. That's what, that's what happens when, that's what should happen when I come around, definitely. Make me a cup of tea. No. Um, what are, what are um, some ways that we can make people feel welcome 
in church? Let's ask the big kids. What are some ways that we can make people feel welcome in church? A lot of the same stuff, but welcome. Sit, sit beside them. Yeah. Smile at them. What? Now I heard a good one. Talk to them. Yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways that we can make people feel welcome. But, you know, talking about making people feel welcome reminds me of a story that happened in the Bible. It happened to Jesus, actually. So, you see, Jesus was out in the, in the countryside talking to a, all kinds of people like he tended to do. And all these parents wanted to bring their kids to see Jesus. But you know what? Not you two, clearly. But most kids are noisy. They're squirmy. They ask a lot of questions. They constantly interrupt people. You guys, are you are you like that? No. <laughs> they never want to interact with the children's story. They just want to sit quietly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, and the disciples thought, you know what? Jesus is way too busy to deal with these kids. So the disciples started to send them away and say, go away. Take your kids away. This is too crazy for Jesus. And Jesus said, what? No. Let the children come to me. They're welcome here. In fact, the kingdom of God belongs to children. So basically what Jesus was saying was that it doesn't matter whether you're squirmy or noisy or ask a lot of questions. You're welcome here. And the thing is, is it's, it's a good story for us to remember because it's not just about kids. It's about all kinds of people. And I think one of the things that, that, that is great about the story is let's think of, of kids being noisy. Well, God wants people who are noisy in church so that they worship with loud voices. God wants people that are squirmy because it means that they'll get down to business and do things. And God wants people who ask a lot of questions so that people are engaging with their faith. So I think that all people are welcome in church. And so we're going to have communion later. And I wanted to put this mat in front of the communion table to remind us that everybody is welcome, especially to this table. Elders, don't trip on it when you grab your stuff. And now let's have a word of prayer, and then you can head off to Sunday school. Dear God, help us to make everyone feel welcome at church. Amen. Right, you guys can head off to Sunday school. Our first reading this morning comes from Job, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now, the book of Job is one of the most difficult books to interpret. Today, we hear how this story all began. And one thing that is made blatantly clear is that the book of Job rejects the notion that suffering is necessarily the result of sin and that material success is necessarily faithfulness. Then our responsive reading comes from Psalm chapter 26 verses 1 to 8. Now this is an interesting psalm because it is a plea by someone who has been falsely charged with a wrongdoing. The psalm Please for God to vindicate the psalmist because the psalmist has walked the, with faithfulness. It is very reminiscent of the struggles that Job faced, undeserved suffering of the innocent. Then our gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. When reading this passage, we must remember that society at the time was highly stratified. Children were close to the bottom of the social pyramid. And it appears that the disciples regard the children as too socially insignificant for Jesus's attention. Yet Jesus points out that the realm of God belongs to people who are like children, i.e. not only have an innocence in faith, 
but are low on the social hierarchy. So before we hear these words, let us pray. O Holy Lord, open our ears and hearts to what you would have us hear this day. Inspire us through your spirit that our worship is not limited to this building, that our listening to your word is not restricted to this reading, but that we worship and listen to you in every moment of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, amen. The first, <coughs> sorry, the first Bible reading this, uh, this morning is Job 2, verses 1 to 2. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. Stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went down from the presence of the Lord, but to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd, for which, well, I'm sorry, with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. And his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God, <clears throat> curse God and die. But he said to her, <coughs> Sorry, but he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good of the, at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The responsive reading is Psalm 26 and is found in the bulletin on page 2. <clears throat> Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. And go around you all. O oh Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. The Gospel reading is Mark 10, verses 13 to 16. Jesus, blesses little children. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is so such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, 
whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. May God bless this reading to his holy word. Thank you very much, choir. I recently saw on a friend's Facebook page an important exercise in gratitude. It read, I am thankful for laundry because it means that my family has clothes to wear. I am thankful for dishes, because it means that my family has food to eat. 
I am thankful for bills because it means we have financial provisions. I am thankful for making beds because it means we have warm, soft places to rest at night. I am thankful for dusting because it means we have furniture to enjoy. I am thankful for vacuuming because it means we have a home to look after. Well, seeing this list of things to be thankful for has, has made me think about other areas in which I could improve on my gratitude. For example, I'm thankful for a cluttered desk. You've all seen my desk. Because it means that I have work to do. Or perhaps I'm thankful for the rain because it, it means that the salmon will have water for the rivers. Or I am thankful for the quirky characters of this congregation because it means that we are a true family. It seems appropriate to spend some time discussing what we are thankful for on such a Sunday as this. But at first read, the scripture passages do little to help us articulate this gratitude. I can remember struggling through Job in seminary, especially as one who studied Hebrew rather than Greek, and trying to decipher what it all means. As mentioned in the introduction, it is not an easy book to interpret. In fact, it is even a difficult book to translate because the Hebrew in the original text is so archaic that we don't know what some of the words mean. Yet, I am thankful for passages in the Bible that are challenging. Because it means that God wants us to engage with the word. I'm also thankful for scholars like the Reverend Dr. Carl Jacobson, because it means that I can use some of his words to help us explain some of the complicated texts. For example, Dr. Jacobson helps us wrap our heads around the introduction of Satan. Now, most of us assume that Satan was the one who tricked Eve into eating the fruit off the tree of knowledge. But remember, nowhere, nowhere in Genesis does it say that Satan, or even the devil, was there. The first time Satan is introduced is in 1 Chronicles when Satan provokes David to count the soldiers of Israel, which angers God because God already knows how many soldiers Israel has. When Satan is introduced in Job, it is not meant to signify one particular person, like, say, the devil. In fact, we should try to dispel the idea that Satan and the devil mean the same thing. They don't. Rather, Satan is a Hebrew word for an adversary. In Hebrew, the verb to oppose or to thwart is sat on. And as Dr. Jacobson says, the Satan in Job works in much the same way as the angel of the Lord who appears to Belem's donkey blocking Belem's donkey's way as his adversary. Now, now, that story takes place in Numbers, chapter 22. And in that story, the Lord is in fact called, the God is called, sat on in Hebrew. Now, the, the Satan is, is usually an angel who serves as an adversary or a prosecuting attorney. And what is often overlooked but cannot be ignored in Job is that Satan functions as an adversary on God's behalf. God 
send Satan to Job. In the book of Job, Satan is not a, a name, but rather an office. And in, in case that isn't confusing enough, Satan doesn't show up for the rest of the book. So really, all the talk about who Satan is or what Satan does, well, doesn't matter to the rest of Job's life. Now, I know that this is a very, very odd passage to deconstruct and attempt to interpret on Thanksgiving Sunday. Say nothing of the fact that we have communion. But it is also an intriguing passage. God sends Satan to demonstrate that Job, despite all struggles, all ailments, deaths, and pain, will not curse God. This section of Job that, that Marg read is setting the stage for the rest of the book. We would do well to remember that Job always argues, believes, even complains that his life and breath even in his awful circumstances, are in God's hands. Not Satan's, God's hands. But, but here's where we can tie this book into our annual Thanksgiving holiday. When Job's wife asks him, do you still persist in your integrity, curse God and die? Basically saying, just get it over with. And that's after one issue. He's got a whole bunch more to happen in his life. Well, Job reminds his wife time and time again, shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? I think, I think we tend to be, uh, we tend to forget to be thankful each day. It's why we have a holiday dedicated to it. And yet we have no trouble complaining or, or even cursing every day. I'm absolutely in that boat. For a while, there was a phrase that was rather popular in, in hipster vernacular in which one would state that we have first world problems. Your phone battery died, first world problem. Your car won't start, first world problem. Tim's ran out of coffee, first world problem. There's nothing good on TV, first world problem. It, it highlighted that all those complaints we have, all those beefs, all those pity parties, usually have more to do with our amazing privilege than they do with real problems. What, what a privilege it is to be able to complain about so many problems in our personal lives. Now, I, I will absolutely admit that my biggest problem is with complainers. I ironically complain about complainers nearly every day. I, I had to stop reading the beef section in the newspaper every morning because it made me so mad. So, so I likely have a bit of an agenda in this sermon. Imagine turning those complaints into thanks. I will be thankful for the bad because it means I have experienced the good. Now, we, we tend to think that what makes Job a man of integrity is that he never complained. But the truth is, he complained a lot. So much so that I started complaining about him. He was in pain. He was heartbroken. He was depressed. He was angry. But what gave him integrity is that he never cursed God. Job argues against the often simplistic view that only good things come when people are good. Job speaks against what is often referred to as the prosperity gospel. 
Job speaks against the idea that financial wealth and physical well-being are directly linked to the will of God. Or more importantly, Job speaks against the idea that those who are facing challenges are facing them because it is a sign of being out of sync with God's will. And here's where I, I want to tie it again into Thanksgiving. It was Governor General Vincent Massey who issued a proclamation in 1957 that stated that we should have a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God for the bountiful harvest with which Canada has been blessed. Now, we, we absolutely should give thanks for all that is good in our lives. We cannot receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad. When Job asks this rhetorical question, Job is not being fatalistic. Instead, it is an, it is an instruction. It acknowledges that true gratitude and faith also involves struggle. And these struggles are not usually because of a deal with the devil. Rather, they are a reality of, an, of a life of immense blessing. I am thankful that Jesus says, let the children come to me for it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Because it means that one must have faith like a child. It means that being confused by scripture is normal. It also means that no matter where we are in our understanding of our relationship to God, or, or no matter what struggles we are facing, or even how we react to those struggles, that we are welcomed to this table. Let us be thankful for the welcome that we receive at Christ's table. But we would do well to also be thankful that God is with us in our good days, days in which we are truly thankful for all that is good in our lives. God is also with us in our bad days, those days that cause us to stumble and struggle. Many of us have aches and pains in our bodies, and usually they are a symptom of an active life in our youth. I will be thankful for that pain in my hip because it means that I had fun. Today, I will be thankful for the challenges because it means I have much, I have much to be thankful for. Amen. Please note that our doxology today is different. <laughs> now the tune may be familiar, but the words are also a little different. So your feedback on this doxology is certainly welcome. I will be thankful for the constructive criticisms that come my way because it means that we're talking about worship. We truly do have an overabundance of blessings in our lives. Let us show this gratitude by showing it to others. Our gifts and our offerings will now be received.
Let us pray. We praise you indeed, O God, for we are thankful for the harvest and all that deepens our relationship with you. We thank you that we are welcomed at your table thanks to copious amounts of grace. Receive these offerings as symbols of our gratitude. Receive these prayers as an expression of our faith. You are in and through it all. Amen. As the seed which was scattered to all corners of the field comes together to make bread for our table, so God's people gather from all corners of the world on this World Communion Sunday to share in this feast. At God's table, there are no divisions. At God's table, we are all welcome to share the bounty of abundant life. Here at God's table, we join with all who love God a little and want to love God more. It does not matter whether you are a born and raised Presbyterian or are coming to this table for the first time. You are welcome here. At the time of communion, we will serve the bread and you are welcome to consume it when you feel ready, and then we will serve the juice and you are ready to and you are able to consume it when you feel ready. Let us prepare ourselves for communion by singing hymn number 527, Eat This Bread. We will sing it through three times. Please remain standing if you are able and let us affirm our faith together by saying the Apostles' Creed, found at 539 in the hymn book or on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join together in the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
for the fruits of, uh, of the earth, for the food of our, on our tables, for the love of our friends and family, and the joining with our brothers and sisters in faith around the world. We do indeed give you thanks and praise, O oh God. Time and time again, you have demonstrated that there is hope, even when we are faced with despair. We have heard the stories in which you made covenants with Sarah and Abraham, in which you led the people out of slavery into the wilderness and onto a land of milk and honey. Even then, we struggled not to curse you. So you brought prophets and leaders to proclaim your hope. Even then, we struggled to listen, and you decided to become present to us in the manifestation of your Son. Therefore, with the rivers and the wind, the mountains and the valleys, with voices from all over this world, which you have created, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give special thanks for Jesus, the one who taught, healed, and led those who, who others had rejected. We thank you that he welcomes all, including children, to the kingdom. We give you thanks for his witness and commitment to truth and love. We give thanks for his healing of broken spirits and broken bodies. In Jesus and in this feast, you provide the sustenance we need to respond to the cries of those in need and of creation. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Transforming God, you call us to sing the songs of faith in places that are familiar and strange. You call us to share this meal with longtime friends and new acquaintances. Pour out your spirit on this table and these people. As we eat and drink, may we feel the wind of your spirit rush through us so that there is a fire in our hearts and love in our actions. May the presence of the Spirit make this meal an occasion for gratitude in all that we experience. And as we prepare to eat together, we join our voices, saying the prayer which your Son taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. When we eat this bread and when we drink this cup, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. This, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This, this is the blood of Christ shed for you, the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
Let us pray. God of mystery and miracles, we thank you for the time we have shared together. With these elements, you have nourished and sustained us with your way, your truth, and your life. We thank you that we can join with churches around the world on this day. By this bread that was broken, may we each be restored for the work yet to come in binding your church together. By this cup that was shared, may we share in compassion and comfort for all your people. Send us, send us, send us, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Praise be to you now, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 555, Worship the Lord.
because it means you have much to be thankful for. God the Creator, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit not only sends you, but goes with you this day and always.